Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we have something a little bit different than uh, my usual output because while I am looking at comedy and comedians today, it's not going to be in stream form because today we're looking at two brand new specials from Ricky Gervais and Dave Chappelle. If you know me or if you're familiar with my work, you may be familiar with my videos looking at deep into conservative comedy. And while Dave Chappelle and Ricky Gervais aren't conservative per se, I would say that they're aligned with a lot of those same comedians because they've fallen into a rut of being associated with anti-wokeness and an anti-progressive crowd, mostly due to Dave Chappelle's transphobia and Ricky Gervais's just general unlikability. With that in mind, I wanted to take a slightly different approach to looking at these two comedians and their most recent specials, considering they're both comedians who have had a long history of being really great storytellers, of being comedians who not only tell jokes, but have let people think through their jokes and given room to, to approach tough subjects. Unfortunately, after several years of controversies and each one going up on stage and talking multiple times about being canceled, despite having massive platforms thanks to Netflix specials like these, I just kind of left disappointed in both of these specials. Ricky Gervais is far more than Dave Chappelle's, but we will talk about them both in equal measure. But first off, let's start with Dave's special. Chappelle's special is titled Dreamer and is a lot more introspective than Ricky's. It starts off with a quote from uh, Henry David Thoreau and immediately opens up with black and white footage of Dave in that Washington DC venue that he filmed Killing Them Softly in 24 years ago, the same venue that he returns to for this special. So already there's a sense of history going on here. It's almost forming a narrative and it really brings you in because that's something that Dave has done really well, is, is reflected on his history in the last couple specials and really reflecting on why he's gotten where he has, how he's gotten where he has and the journey along the way. The problem with this special and like Dave's previous specials is that he can't seem to not punch down at things that just really seem like minor annoyances to him at best. In this special, we'll see a lot of that punching down aimed at trans people. Like literally the, the special would be completely fine. It wouldn't be an all timer, but it would be like a pretty good comedy special led by a really respected and great storyteller if Dave didn't feel the need to just constantly jab at trans people for literally no reason. The opening bit is a great example of how he does this because he starts off reminiscing about the death of his father and then a comedian friend, Norm MacDonald, taking him to the set of a movie to meet Jim Carrey to cheer him up. Jim Carrey being one of his comedy idols and it, it turns into this whole thing about Andy Kaufman and how Jim Carrey, who was playing Andy Kaufman, stayed in character the whole time. And it's this kind of sad turducken of a joke because despite ostensibly being, you know, starting with the death of his father, relying on his friends, meeting Jim Carrey, telling the story, the punchline, all of this is just leading up to a punchline about trans people. That is literally just the punchline. It, it doesn't build off of anything and go from there. Because I wanted to meet Jim Carrey <laughs> and I had to pretend his name was Andy Kaufman all afternoon <laughs> and he was clearly Jim Carrey. I could look at him and I could see he was Jim Carrey. Anyway, I say all that to say, that's how trans people make me feel. We get some jokes about handicapped people that aren't really jokes. He just says he makes the handicapped sit in the back. And these opening moments really set the tone for Dave's special. Going from someone who can genuinely be a really great storyteller, who excels at bringing people into his world and taking them on a journey, and he just immediately throws that potential away. However, that didn't stop these offensive jokes from getting uproarious applause from the audience. We've talked a lot before about how people will just go to comedy shows to see their biases and bigotry affirmed, given a spotlight by somebody who can say what nobody else will say, even though they're specifically there to say it and people pay to see them say it. A lot of that comes down to this idea of offending, but none of this, especially from Dave, feels all that sincere. Like his heart isn't really in it. Not that there's no like venom behind it or anything, 
it just it feels hollow it feels like he's pandering to an audience and when it comes across so plainly like that it loses any teeth or edge it may have had and falls flat it's it's no longer offensive and thus therefore no longer funny even as an offensive joke this opening stretch is the roughest bit of his special by far he does an opening bit about the congressman madison cawthorn he lists off an assortment of absolutely hack jokes that i'm i'm honestly surprised he even did on uh madison cawthorn losing his seat and running a bad race just like real real open mic fodder here like this is stuff i think would be beneath someone like dave and it feels like he's just sleepwalking through an open mic set Next, of course, he goes back to the trans stuff, and this is like less than 10 minutes in, and he has to go back to this well again already. It really is odd, of all the things going on in the world, of all the places this guy has been, of all the people he knows, these are the things that he continually comes back to, to jab at, to make fun of. Not even like specific trans people, just trans people in general, the idea of transness. His goal isn't to offend by poking at insecurities or making people think it's just by being broadly distasteful. Distaste being the operative word here as Dave goes into a bit about a play that he wrote about a black trans woman whose pronoun is the N-word. It's a very sad play, but it's, it's moving. It's about a black transgender woman whose pronoun is sadly <laughs> It's a tearjerker. At the end of the play, she dies of loneliness because white liberals don't know how to speak to her. <laughs> Sad. Speaking of I've also been working on a book, and this is true. I'm rewriting the American classic, Huckleberry Finn. It's the one joke that transphobes have. He riffs on pronouns a little bit, and this joke, just despite having an actual setup, doesn't really go anywhere. And he just does a, a poor transition to a joke about Huckleberry Finn being a white trash name. This whole opening section is absolutely the weakest of the entire special because he just kind of takes the shotgun approach to some broad anecdotes and vaguely offensive topics like making fun of Madison Cawthorn and transness. His next joke is immediately after the Huckleberry Finn thing. If he would... Uh, be accused of a crime, he would just claim to be a woman. That way he could go to a woman's prison. The punchline there being that he would be able to assault women in a women's prison. Oddly enough, right after this, we get a pretty good bit about the dead people on the Titanic uh, seeing the billionaire submarine come down to them. And then ending with a bit about taking a submersible to see the wreck of that like they did with the Titanic. Uh, we get another good bit about the inherent awkwardness of strip clubs and a little throwaway gag about bringing a book to read and sitting next to the stage and reading it because that's where the light is best. He goes into some stuff about his friend Chris Rock and, of course, the Will Smith slap, and you get a lot of Dave's classic storytelling flair here. The pacing and voices do a great job at bringing the viewers in. This section is more of the classic Chappelle that, as a fledgling comedian, I admired. It's followed by another story about him getting assaulted on stage and then goes back to the Chris Rock bit. And this is all woven together really well until he has to literally throw in an aside that the person who assaults him was a trans man. Now, this section does flow the best because Chappelle has always been a breezy and likable speaker. And his tangents here don't feel random. They feel considered and even rehearsed. The jokes here flow really well, but he still has a crass edge that makes this identifiable as a proper Chappelle bit instead of just open mic fodder. But then he, like I said, gets back to trans people. This is getting close to halfway through the special, and Dave has managed to sidetrack himself with trans stuff on nearly every good bit that he had going. And the trans aside is a diversion to the joke that doesn't even add anything, and in fact I would say detracts from it because it's a story about how a whole bunch of his celebrity friends beat up on the trans man who rushed him on stage. But by adding in the fact that he's trans, it takes it from just being a story about, you know, his friends jumping a guy who tried to jump him, but when you throw in Dave's very obvious disdain and the fact that he continually keeps digging at trans people and trying to offend them, it pushes it almost into something that feels like glorifying 
a hate crime, even though that's obviously not what he's talking about. This is purely me putting more thought into it than I think Dave did, but it still left a bad taste in my mouth and just kind of paints the whole thing as a little bit grosser than it needed to be. Like, the joke would have actually flowed better if he didn't have a whole aside about the person being trans. After this, Dave talks a little bit about getting bad press, and you're a millionaire, dude. Like, this is just one long series here of half-hearted riffs on being criticized, something he's been dealing with for decades now. And it comes across as a pity party until it gets to a slightly more touching moment, and one of the best bits of this entire show uh, when he is conferring with his wife after, after you know, a, a possible threat on his life. But the whole section before with the press and mentioning headlines, it just feels so misguided and scattershot. Like, he vaguely gestures at making points about society, about the liberal press, about uh, how they pay attention to certain things over others, but it's just gesturing. He almost seems afraid to, like, speak his mind and wants to toe this line that just depicts him in the most sympathetic light possible while, you know, poking and prodding at things that people in the past have called him out for. And it's like, dude, just commit. However, the next bit involving his wife and a safety deposit box in case he dies is legitimately good. It ends on a great punchline and sees Dave, again, playing to his actual strengths. He's balancing a raunchy and heartfelt tone he's honed since returning to the stage for these Netflix specials. It's a really good bit, and I don't know why the lead-in to it with the fight could have been shorter and still hit harder along the way. There are moments like this throughout where Dave appears to be having fun, where he sinks back into a recognizable rhythm, and in these moments you can see why he's such an icon. But then something distracts him, and you can't help but be reminded that instead of turning his seismic talent and voice for storytelling towards social issues or things that are more relatable, he just can't help but nag at small inconsequential things that bother him. It's real old man yelling at cloud shit. Like half this special, he seems perfectly content to half-heartedly meander through offensive talking points in this very safe forum. Even later in the show, he can't help but end on a trans person joke. Like, he goes on a whole tangent about how far he's come and how much you have to believe in your dreams, and he has a pretty funny aside about Lil Nas X and meeting him for the first time. But then he has to just throw in this odd trans joke that really throws off the rhythm of the bit he was doing and this really strong buildup he had towards the end. All in all, this is another Chappelle special. If you're a diehard fan, you'll probably still like it. As a Fairweather fan of Chappelle, it still had stuff that I like. I still really respect Dave Chappelle as a storyteller. I think he has an amazing verve for introspection, and that allows people to, you know, of all backgrounds, to generally identify with him and his more introspective, like I've said, bits that he's been doing since returning to the stage. He has a really great quality for bringing people into his world, and I just wish that he wasn't so set on trying to push people away at the same time. Like, there are some really solid bits here, and when he's good, he is legitimately great. There's also something kind of miserable about watching this former Maverick settle into this curmudgeonly role. And I think it's kind of even worse that there don't appear to be a lot of convictions behind that need to offend somebody. And speaking of miserable curmudgeons, Let's talk about Ricky Gervais's special, Armageddon. Unlike Dave Chappelle, who can be generally pretty likable, Ricky Gervais's entire shtick is being a miserable, complainy, whinging British person. Sorry, those were all the worst words I could think of to describe him. Like many edgy atheist comedians in the aughts, uh, who found that the well for comedy poking fun at Big Sky Man had very soon run dry, He's since turned his attention to woke people and cancel culture, something that is a joke in and of itself for someone with several Netflix specials. While Dave's special was overall tolerable, maybe a little draggy in some parts, and could have gone without his obsession with punching down without still committing to the bit, Ricky's special has no real reason to exist, because there's nothing here you can't get from a drunk uncle at Thanksgiving, and you'll probably hate your uncle less because you're at least related. Everything about this, from the droll opening credits to the fact that it just opens with him coming out on stage, to the fact that the, there's no real interesting set design and he's just 
all clad in black makes this so flavorless. There's no pop, there's no flair, there's no interesting style to any aspect of it, and that goes for the comedy. Like, he starts by filleting himself, blowing back at critics he couldn't say stuff on his last Netflix special. Nothing says censored like having your special broadcast on Netflix and getting another one a year later. Truly, such a cancelled man. My last show, Supernature, dropped on Netflix last year. Um, big backlash, wasn't there? Big, oh, big backlash. People going, you can't say that. You can. <laughs> I did. Um... And that's pretty much what this special is. Where Dave eventually found a groove and told stories, Ricky is content to talk about what a verbal renegade he is, uh, to the applause of his sycophantic audience, who likely don't care who's being offended as long as something offensive is being said. He starts opening by digging at Twitter bios, very hip and cool, uh, and makes fun of people who put anti-fascist in their bio. Kind of also alluding that those people are the, the real fascists. Half of these aren't even really jokes, they're just vague observations filtered through the lens of a paranoid rich man with no real problems to worry about. We get several minutes on the word queer and how it's being used by straight men who just want some attention. Yeah, that seems like this guy knows a lot of queer people with dyed blue hair. Then we get some really edgy stuff, discussion about the proper term for disabled people, or is it handicapped? Oh, people are too woke these days, which would be great stuff for 2004. We can't have a paranoid white man publicly battling his continued descent to irrelevance without complaining about immigrants, can we? Ah, but wait, we're also getting stupider because of Taylor Swift. Because we are getting more stupid as a species, no doubt about that. You can now do a university degree course in Taylor Swift. How <laughs> low academically can you go? There's an institute in London called the School of Flower Arranging. I went past it, I couldn't believe it. School of Flower Arranging. I looked in and there's people having lectures. Flower arranging. My mum used to pick flowers every day from the garden, cut flowers, put them in vases around the house. At no point did anyone come round and go, what unqualified <laughs> did these? In case you didn't think this guy was gunning for a guest spot on Fox News sometime soon. And this is pretty much how the whole special goes. It's a shotgun approach to trying to offend as many people as possible without actually doing anything new or interesting, without observing anything unique or interesting. And so the whole thing is just actually really, really boring. I would have vastly preferred watching Dave's special again right after. He spends a few bits talking about how rich he is. That's a, another thing he likes coming back to. How humanity is awful and the planet would improve if people just went extinct. In the middle of a bit about prayer and how does God answer all these prayers and how does it get decided, he also has a throwaway gag to the 90s classic Armageddon, which I believe is what... the. I believe the inference being that he named the the special Armageddon after the hit film Armageddon. Um, again, really cutting edge stuff. Really just tip of the spear here, Ricky. Much like Dave's opening before he settled into a rhythm, Ricky just flips back and forth between bits and concepts. Though his are much more crass, like calling Make-A-Wish Kids the R slur uh, for comedic effect, you see. This is all interspersed with more black-pilled, cynical reflecting on how people are better dead and how, uh, of course, how awesome he is at comedy and being offensive, which is a great thing to tell to a paying audience, that old great comedian adage, tell, don't show. Maybe it's just a general affect or how miserable he seems, or that Ricky seems to think a certain British profanity is an appropriate punchline when you need one. But this entire thing is just incredibly boring. See, unlike Dave Chappelle, Ricky Gervais isn't interesting to listen to. He's not a good storyteller, he doesn't tell interesting stories, and at least in this special, he does not have interesting observations to make about the things that he's quipping about. Like, for example, a half hour into this hour-long special, he gets to some really fresh content, and that is Michael Jackson jokes. I am, I am not kidding. Uh, Michael Jackson and the allegations against him. If, if it weren't for his constant whinging at kids these days, I wouldn't be surprised if this dreck just plopped out of some wormhole from the early 2000s. 
A little bit further in, as the crowd cheers him on to do a edgy joke about Chinese kids eating dogs, it really became crystal clear how much of Ricky Shtick and a lot of anti-woke and anti-progressive comedy is just recycled. Like, like pronoun jokes and Michael Jackson jokes and Chinese people eat dogs jokes, this is the same edgy shit I heard on the school bus in 2007. Like, this is middle school comedy hour stuff. And it's been repeated now for some of these jokes for decades. Like, that's all it takes to make some people laugh when they go to a comedy show just to see their biases affirmed. They don't want to actually see new jokes, they just want to play the hits. They don't actually want to see a comedian test their boundaries and, and poke at social norms, despite what a lot of them say and why comedy should be an open space for free speech. Because a lot of the people saying that are trying to defend lazy hacks like Ricky Gervais don't actually want that. They just want the same slop regurgitated to them over and over like a baby bird. Anyway, he digs at homeless people, something he and Dave also have in common. He whinges about woke Hollywood in a series of bits about appropriated identity. And this is more just bitching about something with very little punchline and very little setup. He lazily trots through issues such as cultural appropriation like a show horse, clomping through asides you've probably seen from the Babylon Bee or any other number of conservative pundits on Twitter, but with no real cohesion between them. For example, he just immediately pivots to CRT in a a statement I'll let just speak for himself. Critical race theory, have you heard of that? Being taught in schools now, particularly in trendy areas like LA, right? Just like five-year-old kids and six-year-old kids. If you haven't heard it, in a nutshell, critical race theory says that all white people are racist. It says that we're born racist and we continue to be racist because we're affording the privilege of a racist society set up by our forefathers, okay? So basically, all white people are racist and there's nothing we can do about it, which is a relief. Um, <laughs> That is absolutely not what CRT is and not how it works, but that's what Ricky's anti-woke, anti-progressive audience thinks, so he's playing to them, and they laugh because of it. The rest of this is a tired assortment of bits about internet shopping, Darwinian theories about nature and nurture, an extended sequence where he yells at a pretend child for being a racist, bigot, homophobe, uh, and finishing with a joke about Schindler's List, in case you were wondering if the temperature of this outrageous, boundary-pushing comedy fest ever rises above lukewarm. It does not. The most offensive thing about Gervais's special is the idea that this problem could pass as black or dark comedy, just because he assaults everything with profanity. Like a lot of the other conservative comedians we've seen, there's nothing new, bold, edgy, or even remotely interesting here as he just rambles from point to point. Half of these jokes feel completely underbaked. You get edgier jokes with more effort in Daily Wire comment sections, which just leaves this special as this kind of slog as you watch this once very clever comedian attempt dark, thoughtful satire and landing somewhere much closer to your average open mic rant from somebody who comes once and yells off something vaguely bigoted doesn't get much applause, and goes home. Except here he's found his audience, so I guess good on him. Ricky Gervais' special is absolutely the worst of the two, and might be the gold standard for having a massive platform, yet still crying about how you're censored and nobody can take your jokes and how offended people get, while also pathetically failing to push any boundaries that someone might actually qualify as offensive. Like we've mentioned before in other conservative comedy videos, there's not actually much here that's offensive, partially because there's nothing here that's really that new. If you are in any of these minority groups that they are trying to offend in this, I doubt you can actually be offended by this stuff because it's the kind of jokes you've heard 10,000 times over and over and over. Just told on a slightly bigger stage. But honestly, both of these comedians feel like massive missed opportunities from sharp minds who made their names on the ability to get people to think as well as laugh, to actually push at social norms and prod at people's preconceived misconceptions about things. Because here they seem reduced to either self-aggrandizing or self-mythologizing, and resorting instead to clever extended bits, just resorting to easy laughs at the expense of people they know their audiences probably don't like to begin with. It is a really big bummer 
to see. And I think it's something that we're only going to continue seeing more, especially among rich male comedians, because as they get further and further from their origins, from their roots, and more and more into success and wealth and privilege, the things that used to bother them, the things that made them identifiable everyman, where they could make jokes and write jokes about things that everybody could identify with, be it religion or issues with childcare, or, you know, any of the other number of things that make up a majority of stand-up comedy. They get away from that and start transitioning more into just whining and bitching about whatever they see on the news. The things that don't actually affect their lives, but they don't have much that does affect their lives anymore because they are insulated by their wealth and, I hate using the word, but privilege. I would love to see Ricky's status as a great satirist come back in a meaningful way. I would love to see Dave be able to have a special where he doesn't feel the need to resort to being offensive. Not that he can't be offensive and be funny, but that his definition of offensive these days just isn't funny. It's hack. It's lazy. It's played out. Both of these comedians are better. I don't think they know it, though, is the problem. I don't know if it's a matter of suffering from their own success. I don't know what it is. But I've seen other comedians also fall into this rut. As you get older, you get more curmudgeonly about things, and it just turns into these rants of, like I mentioned earlier, what feels like old men yelling at clouds. That being said, if you've followed either of these comedians for any amount of time, I don't think any of this is going to come as much of a surprise. They've both been on similar trajectories, both taking plenty of hits from people for their offensive content and then firing back, mostly defending themselves, saying, ah, you can't take a joke and stuff like that. We've, we've all seen it before on social media. But it, I feel it's less of people not being able to take a joke and... In these cases, these legendary comedians not being able to write a good one. Which shouldn't be the case for, for Dave Chappelle and Ricky Gervais. And I would, I would certainly put Dave Chappelle in terms of talent way above Ricky Gervais. But like, both of them have written funny things. Both of them are funny people. I, I don't want to say that they aren't. I don't want to say that they have no talent because they absolutely do. But the things that they're resorting to for their offense are so far beneath them. And I don't think they realize that. And that's that's the really hard part about watching some of these comedians get older, is I think they don't realize how much better they still could be doing. Anyway, this was just a little brief look, uh, interstitial video uh, at these new comedy specials because I've done videos on comedy before and they've generally done pretty well on here. So let me know what you think down below. Are you going to check these specials out? If you haven't seen my other videos on conservative comedy, go check those out at the channel. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please consider giving a few dollars to my Patreon because I do this all as a full-time job now and I am desperately trying to improve things like my production ability, uh, video editing, video software, and like just even cameras and stuff right now. So literally every bit helps as always and you get to be listed alongside these cool names that you'll see on the screen right now with all that out of the way thank you very much for watching and i hope you have a wonderful rest of your day